I'm Katie. And I'm Kay. And you're listening to the Babes of Quinny podcast. Just making sure. You know when the anxiety is just high, so. Yeah, yeah I feel that. <laughs> okay, well, I'm sick again. Not like I was sick last week and it's lingering, but. It's just been lingering since like November. And I've had this sexy voice. The, the what is it? The, the foam porn stars? The sex, the sex phone. Sexy phone times. Yeah. Hello. 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 <laughs> I just sound like um not not like so much vocal fry. That's what that uh, sound is when you talk. You're like hey, 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 hey. like a valley girl. What's going on? Oh, nothing. I have a list of things I want to talk about. Did you actually bring it? Because last week I didn't bring it. Um, last week I didn't bring it, but now I don't know what day is what. Yeah, I but, know, because it's the 21st. We're four days to Christmas. And uh, so the first thing on my list is drag brunch. Yeah, we but went But did to we that. talk about that last week? I think so. I don't remember what don't day remember. it is. When was it? Was it on the 11th or the 18th? It was on the 11th. Okay, right. So, yeah, we probably talked about it. Because last weekend I was home, this past weekend I was homesick the whole weekend. Okay. So it was the weekend before. So I'm assuming we talked about it. Well, if not, Drag Brunch is great. Thanks, Taylor. Thank you, Taylor, Grind of Mine, and Renona Way. Ro- Rowena. Rowena. Rowena Way. Gosh, I'm so bad at saying names. <laughs> it's a struggle. So um, I was on, there's two no, notable, words are hard today, mm-hmm. notable Belleville Neighbors posts I want to talk about today. Give them to me. Okay, so the first one um, is very clearly a joke. But this woman's sense of humor really brought it to me today. So her name is Nadine, and she wrote this beautiful novel. It says, it's 1 a.m. and I can't sleep because there's a gang of teenage raccoons using my roof as a slip and slide. I decided to go out and let these raccoons know that it was past my curfew, only to discover that my van had a beautiful dusting of tree. And then there's a photo of her tree being a tree um, just on top of her vehicle. This was after like that snowstorm. Last oh, week. okay, yeah, yeah. So she's like, I didn't, I did think it looked pretty out, so I decided to take the dog for a walk. The dog took off like a bat out of hell, mm-hmm. so I got four weeks of cardio finished in about seven minutes. I didn't realize it was slippery out mm-hmm. until I did the splits. I didn't know you could do the split. I didn't know I could do the splits. Probably didn't help that I was wearing slippers. I'm 51. Why would I wear boots? You don't need boots. <laughs> I did, however, take these beautiful photos. No flash required. Yes, it was that bright out. And yes, it is beautiful. It was that beautiful. Sit back and relax. Enjoy the photos. I probably won't be posting anymore for a few days. I'll be too busy icing my groin. Holy. And they're just like really beautiful photos of the When was that last week? That was, yeah, it was like last week after the snowstorm. Yeah. And I just thought it was a really funny post and I screenshotted all of it. That's great. And I was like, oh, that made me laugh. I just like, it was just nice to see a post that somebody wasn't like complaining. She was just like. She's just like, this funny thing happened. This this crazy thing happened. And she's like, I'm 51. I didn't need no boots. And I'm like, damn, you're my kind of people. I wear Crocs in the winter, my winter Crocs. I had um, one of Kate's friends came over and he was wearing Crocs. And I was like, what are you doing? They used to be my going out shoe. Like, I think I've told you this, but my my university picture, I'm holding my Crocs. Yes, I've seen this photo. Yeah. Mm. They're practical, especially the winter ones. You just flip them four There's winter four. Crocs? Yeah, they're insulated. Ins- oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I have two pairs. You would. <laughs> I wear them to work sometimes, but then my feet get hot. Okay, because, like, I understand because I wore Kate's Crocs once to the car to go get something, and they're, like, they feel good on the feet. Mm-hmm. But they're just so ugly. They are. And I have to say something. Okay. And I'm going to sound like a D-bag. But I was wearing them before they were cool because <laughs> I started farming in them like, I started farming in them in like 2015. So you're like an influencer. Well, apparently not because no one knew. Like, I don't think I made them cool. I was just wearing them out and about because they were practical. But anyway, I remember like way back when, this is like before Kate was born. There was like a Crocs store yeah. on Queen Street in Toronto. Oh, yeah. 
And I used to walk by it every day. I'm like, how many people are actually buying Crocs that you need a whole store? Now it's Apparently crazy. everybody. Everyone has Crocs. And Jibbets. XXL gets, they get. They get Crocs Crocs there, yeah. whenever she gets a new employee. Hey, man who shall not be named. Let's get some I want Crocs. Crocs. I want Jibbets too. I love Jibbets. Like, I, what, what's like, what would be your Jibbet if you could get a custom Jibbet? The Babes of Cooking Podcast logo. Can you do that? Oh, yeah. I think you can get custom Jibbets. I feel like I need to get you a gibbet, a babe's gibbet. I always lose my gibbets, though. <laughs> if, if you don't know what a gibbet is. A gibbet is a croc jewel, if you will. It's like <laughs> a, a charm. accessory. You can put in your crocs. I'll, I'm going to get all my crocs out at home, and I'm going to post a picture on babes. I will say, though, that a lot of them, because I far, they're disgusting, one of them is being held together by Baylor twine. Why, why are we not disposing of the crocs? Well, because I don't have, like, a good pair yet. I need a new good <laughs> pair. <laughs> Do you own a pair of Crocs? No, my kid has Crocs. Oh my god! I'm but I don't. I don't. Gift. No, please do not buy me Crocs. You'll wear them. You'll fall in love. Oh, I'll wear them at the office. Yeah, do they have like slippers that are like less offensive. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Don't you want to be offensive? I mean, sometimes. Yeah, true. I don't know if it, I want my footwear to be the offensive part of me. I feel like there's way better things to be offensive about. <laughs> Today, I was talking to someone <laughs> about like they're really professional. And then someone was like, yeah, they are. And I was like, I wish I was more professional. Like, I really try. I honestly, I I want to be. I want to But be. I'm just like so, I had this talk like yesterday and the day before. I just like about how uncomfortable I am in myself. Yeah. But yeah, no, I'm just like, soup. I'm in a point in my life that I'm just like really uncomfortable like with myself and my body. And like, oh. I don't feel like I know how to properly dress myself yet. I think to COVID- I didn't don't know what happened with fashion trends, so I'm very lost on what I should. All I really want to do is like wear comfy clothing that is also professional looking. Yeah, I think you look professional. Yeah, I'm like just, some days we do look like we're we're gamers and like we wear hoodies, but but I like a good hoodie. Sometimes like Monday, Monday was my hoodie day. Monday was a hoodie day. Usually like Fridays, I say are casual day for me. Um, so Mark and Charity on ninety five five Hits FM. Also have a podcast. They do. Um, and this morning, the clip that I got from them was about them having a pajama day. And they're like, oh, no, it's just us. I was like, what do you mean it's just us? So I'm hijacking their pajama day. Also, the podcast is called the Mark and Charity Coffee Podcast, by the way. And they're – Mark is the, probably the funniest person So right funny. Now. We get to put it up, and when you don't do it, I do it. And they're so funny to listen. I always listen to the whole thing. It's and I mean yeah they're like fifteen twenty minutes mm-hmm. they're like just like short little clips but they're just they're hysterical because it's like the radio kind of like sensor kind of comes down a little bit and they're a little bit spicier a little bit it's yeah fun. definitely more professional than us oh my god yeah but yeah so I'm like I'm gonna wear pajamas but like they're not gonna look like pajamas well my friends were supposed to come on Friday night yeah because someone my my friend Alana's visiting from. She's home from the East Coast for Christmas. Mm -hmm. But now the storm's coming, so it might be Thursday night, which means I may not be feeling the best on Friday, so I will probably be in pajamas. Okay, well, I'm wearing comfy professional pants. Yeah. I got them at Smash and Test, so I feel like I'll be fine. I don't know what that means, but... It's that romper I wore yesterday. Oh, yeah, I do like that. I think I need that. Except I have a really long torso and little legs, so sometimes when I wear bodysuits, I get camel toe. Okay, so what you can do is you can buy them longer. Longer. Okay. That was a fun conversation. I'm going to, I ate pizza and it's stuck in my mouth. Um, should I segue? Let's segue. This week's guest, <laughs> I have them down as probably the most qualified person. Should I segue? Let's segue. This week's guest, <laughs> I have them down as probably the most qualified person we've spoken to yeah doing amazing work we've had other guests doing amazing work but they're yeah like this this is the kind of work that really changes people people's lives like and you can see it and it's so much more than I thought it was Mm -hmm. I think we both felt that yeah it was they do well that and they've had to rebuild yeah you'll hear all about it you'll hear all about it uh we're going to hit you with an intro, but please enjoy, and we'll catch you at the end of this. Yes. 
Today we are chatting with our most qualified guests yet, who do incredibly important work for the community. Hazim grew up in Belleville and still calls the friendly city home. He spent time in Ottawa at Carleton University, completing a Bachelor of Arts in Economics. Lurking his LinkedIn has made us extra nervous for this interview, as he has an impressive resume working with the Government of Canada and the Canadian Revenue Agency. Over a year and a half ago, he decided to take a career change um, out of the government sector and took on the role of the Executive Director of Habitat for Humanity, Prince Edward Hastings. Bridget is a Belleville transplant originally from Chester Basin, Nova Scotia. She attended Dalhousie University for social anthropology. She moved to Belleville with her children and later attended Loyalist College chef training and completed the sales and marketing program. In May, she took on the position of Affiliate Services Coordinator for Habitat for Humanity. Habitat for Humanity, PEH, has helped contribute to the housing inventory in Belleville for 28 years. They have partnered with families, developers, contractors, volunteers, donors, and suppliers to meet the growing demand for affordable home ownership. A large part of Habitat for Humanity is the Restore, which is a volunteer-supported social enterprise that sells donated, new, and gently used furniture, appliances, and building materials. The success of the Restore covers administrative costs of the organization. Ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between, please welcome Hazim and Bridget from Habitat for Humanity, Prince Edward Hastings. Um, I'm not going to lie. Most qualified guests we've had on so far, and I'm very <laughs> nervous. So here we go. I'm very uh, nervous. Qualified? So. Yeah. yeah. Where'd that come from? Well, our tagline is like, we're two underqualified babes talking with qualified people. And then I was doing my research this morning. And I was like, oh, he's really qualified. <laughs> I'm not qualified. I just... Super qualified. Your LinkedIn says around. otherwise. Get around. Maybe go with qualified, not get around. I like get around. That's what I'm calling this episode. So Hank or You can call me Hazem. Um, Hazem. Okay. Because obviously with diversity and equity, we've tried to, to support that. But if okay. Hank is easier, no. a lot of people know me as Hank. As Hank. Um, but uh, I can't say I support diversity and equity if I continue yeah. to call myself Hank when my name's Hazem. Hazem. Yeah. I can so do that. that. I I can do Hazem. Okay. I just get people to say their names first because I'm really bad at determining what sounds letters make in names, <laughs> so I make it up. So what I always say to everybody is, it's kind of like laughing. You just go, ha ha, and then throw a zum on the end. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> yep. And you're originally from Belleville. Well, yeah. Um, born in Syria, and then, yeah, I grew up in Belleville. Oh, All okay. of my friends were from Belleville. And so how old were you when you came to Belleville? Uh, I'd say five Five years old. Okay. Yeah. And you went to Quinny. Saw that on your yes, LinkedIn too. Yes, I went to Quinny, unfortunately. <laughs> really? I well, feel like it was a good time. I it was a good time. Did you go there? No. Oh. Is that the school that was just torn down? Or is that the one that was on near the col- on College Street? On College Street. That's the COVID center now. Yeah, it's the COVID okay. center. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did it have a daycare when you were there? No, it didn't. Oh. No, I knew sure. they, convert, they converted the library into a daycare. Oh, Oh, Love. so no more reading, just babies. Did they move the library? Or yeah, they... they moved it around, oh, okay. and I think the uh, the courtyard ended up um, becoming the daycare. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's it's good. Not a, that's not a good thing they for kept high kids school. Kids outside. Yeah. Like, the children seven. had to be outside. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't matter the weather, right? And then again, going from things I googled about you. Oh lord. You went to Carleton. Yeah. Oh my gosh, is that on Google? Yeah. It's on your LinkedIn. Uh, oh, yeah. And you that answered be, it on yeah. the Google form. Yes. And you I took did. a BA of economics. Yes. How exciting was that? I like numbers and uh, that was right up my, my alley. But uh, yeah, it's a really boring, lots of formulas. It's actually quite boring, but yeah. And I don't practice it at all. I, I mean, it was a degree, oh. but it doesn't mean that I became, a, you know, an economist. You didn't? No. Yeah. I ended up working with a bunch of accountants. So it didn't actually get used. And you didn't fill out the form. I did just this morning. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> just like. Well, didn't see it. Five minutes ago. Are you from Belleville? No, I'm Where are you from, from Chester Basin, Nova Scotia. Oh, East Coast. Mm-hmm. So yeah, what tower. brought you to Belleville? Uh, my ex-husband. Uh, he at Dalhousie University and I needed to get the next job. <laughs> How do you like that decision? Uh, it <laughs> was. <laughs> not the right one <laughs> we all learn and whatever you follow well men. now i can look Sorry. at your form and now i've learned that you don't get married when you're in your 20s yeah because you don't you're not still that person no 
It's like, I believe you shouldn't marry your high school sweetheart. Sorry if you guys, you did that. <laughs> no? Okay. Mm-mm. And you took anthropology. Sociology and social anthropology, yeah. And you're a chef? Chef training, yeah. I had a national food business for about seven years, too. What was Holy crap? <laughs> tell us more. Oh, golly. It's a really complicated story. Um, I made cookie mixes, lactation cookie mixes for breastfeeding moms to boost their milk supply. What? I could have yeah. used that. So <laughs> yeah. I, I have a two year old and a 14 yeah. year old. I could probably still make them. I, I, well, I can probably figure that I don't out. Have time. <laughs> we're no, we're far past uh, that uh, now. Yeah. yeah. So and and <laughs> so you just started. When did you start at Habitat? Um, May of okay. this year. Okay. But it took me like it was an incredible journey to get here, which I'm kind of excited about, and hopefully we can talk about. That oh, later, we will. Yeah. Okay. Let's go. Um. Before you worked at Habitat, you worked for the government. Yes. And the Canadian Revenue Agency. Yes. And what did you do there? Are you allowed to talk about it? <laughs> that, well, I mean, that a silly question. <laughs> it's it's part of my bio, right? Yeah. Um. It's you know it was twenty eight years, and I started out of university with a degree in economics, and and um, kind of you know you wander your way around. It's a very large organization mm-hmm. uh, with plenty of uh, room to maneuver, and. Um, they saw the leadership potential uh, in my skill sets, and I ended up uh, competing with a bunch of, I don't know, executive wannabes from across the country uh, for uh, their uh, much sought after executive de- development program. And then I uh, got into that, and they spent a fortune on making sure that you are an executive uh, in, in the making, and uh, you graduate out of the program, and then they move you around a bit uh, here, there, a little everywhere. and. I ended up having the fortune of um, getting an opportunity to uh, take a position in in Belleville uh, for uh, an assistant director position in, in collections and then did that for a few years and then was promoted to director after a, a selection process for that position. And uh, I was the candidate that was uh, chosen for that role. So I was director of um, uh, the tax office that covered at that time East Central Ontario, which is Kingston, Peterborough and Belleville. And had 300 auditors and collectors and um, and then left that and, you know, to figure out what I wanted to do in the next stage of my life. What I'm really proud of is is uh, the volunteer work and working in the charity space. Uh, working with Habitat for Humanity was uh, because of Humane Society. I was going to ask, yeah, because yeah. I saw you also helped with get this new facility yeah, I, kind of rolling. Yeah, so the the board chair and and some key uh, players on on the board of directors, um, they had been discussing you know whether to build or buy for a few years, and and uh, I was able to come in at the right time and help them through that that uh, discussion uh, to the point where we decided that it was uh, um, more economical, but a little harder journey uh, to build where they currently are, and. Um, Everything goes from there. Once the decision's made, you just kind of do some things, get some things in place, uh, talk to the right people. Um, and um, yeah, next thing you know, you've got a, a beautiful new uh, humane society. And I thought, well, gee, if I can, if I can help with, uh, you know, animals, uh, maybe I can actually help with people instead of taking away from, uh, you know, their pockets when they've got a tax issue. So I thought, okay, well, um, Habitat came up. Uh, I applied. I was interviewed with uh, a group of others and uh, shortlisted and then uh, brought in. Wow. That's definitely going to be my crutch word today. Wow. 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 So what's your official title? Mine? Yes. Oh, executive director. Cool. Habitat. Habitat, Prince Edward Hastings. Okay. And what does that entail being an executive director? Well, a little bit of everything. Uh, It's, it's, um, it is honestly everything. So when I came in, uh, they were, um, in a state of restructuring. So they just brought in five new uh, board of uh, directors. Um, We had uh, some staff transition coming out of COVID. Uh, There was no staff. And um, the affiliate side, which is where uh, all the planning occurs, uh, was was in a bit of disarray. Uh, There was just myself and the uh, affiliate services coordinator at that time. She had been there about a year. So no executive director you know, history that was, uh, um, I didn't have that ability to leverage. And then, um, yeah, we were just starting over from scratch, no strategic plan, no budget. Uh, it really was starting over again. So there was a lot of work that had to go on. 
And uh, that includes, you know, um, you know, hiring cleaners, um, getting the place back up to uh, speed uh, structurally. It needed a new roof. Uh, it needed signage. It had zero wow. signs. Um, the parking lot was was starting to uh, to decay. We had to protect the park. Like it was every. It's up on like Loyola. Double board. Yeah. I never knew it was there. Yeah. Be- until this year. So that is a common theme. Good. I feel like you had something to do with that. Okay. Well, and that's it. The building just kind of sat there in the dark, mm-hmm. and um, some previous decisions about lighting on the outside. Uh, diverting the uh, power that went to the outdoor lights uh, to other areas that needed power in the building. And so the building was literally in the dark with, uh, you know, a bunch of patchwork on the roof. At one point we had tarps on the roof. It oh just looked, wow. it just looked yeah. like a decrepit building in the dark and people mm. would drive by it. And, and we saw that in the sales. Uh, we weren't, we weren't getting people coming out. Nobody knew what that building was for. So you clean up the roof, you put up the sign, you re, uh, you know, seal the parking lot, put new lines on it and get a nice, uh, you know, LED billboard out front. And it just kind of reinvigorates and regenerates, um, you know, the potential that, that it deserves, uh, because the restore is the, uh, underpin of, of everything that we do. Uh, it, it, it gives us the resource base so that we can go and do the strategic planning and, and bring in uh, staff that will help us achieve our objective. Right. Mm-hmm. Everyone deserves a safe and decent, a decent place to live. So that's where we uh, felt that the store needed to be uh, re-energized. So um, for those who may not know, can you tell us what the ReStore is? Um, it's a social enterprise. So what, how it works is that um, it's a donation drop-off center. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also have national uh, accounts uh, through Habitat Canada because we are an affiliate. We are tr- uh, tied to Habitat Canada which is tied to Habitat uh, for Humanity International. Uh, and we are governed, because it's a charity, we are governed by bylaws. And those bylaws, you know, um, outline how we're supposed to interact with each of those different levels of, of that uh, charitable organization. So we have uh, Habitat Canada that strikes and deals nationally with uh, large chains, such as uh, Winners or Canadian Tires, as examples. And then we get uh, the opportunity to buy product that they've donated to uh, Habitat Canada, to their distribution center in uh, Brampton. Uh, we get a chance to buy stuff from them at a, a obviously a, a fair price uh, because the Habitat Canada also needs money t- mm-hmm. uh, to, to um, operate. And we then can sell those goods. So that's one aspect of where our goods come from. And that's what we try to promote when we, when we order stuff from Habitat Canada because that's the brand new stuff. A lot of people don't realize we aren't just thrift. We are brand new as well. Mm-hmm. And um, those are those are the really cool items that we get, like Roombas. And I, and I was going to bring that up because yeah. our coworker got a Roomba. It was a big thing in the office that she got a Roomba. And I might also get a Roomba because I think there was still some left. But. There was. And when she made that comment, the Roomba sold out in like 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think personally, I didn't know. For me, Habitat is we do a lot of like home renos or like when we need to buy fixtures and stuff, we're always like, Oh, let's go see what's at the restore first. Um, so I just always thought I could just buy flooring there or, or stuff. So it was, it was nice hearing when Emily was like, I got a Roomba. And then we all, I think went on the Habitat's website because right. now you can, there's an online store. Mm-hmm. So did, how long has that been up? Has that always been up? No, that was another one of the new additions. Um, and that is thanks to uh, some grant applications uh, that we uh, applied on. Uh, the Ontario Trillium Foundation was uh, very instrumental in making that happen. And so that gave us the resources because we didn't have many uh, at the time and we still don't, but we relied on donations and grants. So the grant gave us the opportunity to hire uh, a very capable young gentleman named Brandon Urch, who is our um, digital media coordinator. Uh, and he, along with uh, Big Red Bow, had um, helped us uh, design our webpage that included the e-commerce platform. And so that's where we're at uh, with that. It, it's it's still fairly new and it's a, it's a bit of a challenge because we don't have a standard set of product that we order in. Mm-hmm. We don't have a deep you know quantity of that particular product because the other half of being a social enterprise um, is the donation aspect. Yeah. And so our back uh, uh, bay door... Uh, opens up when people come in with their couch or their, you know, dining room table and chairs or whatever it is that they've got that they feel is, is gently used and uh, is still got some life in it for, for someone else to utilize. Um, so 
you know, gently used um, um, material that was uh, construction material that could still be used. Uh, countertops, mm-hmm. sinks, vanities. Uh, there's so much, obviously, that goes into a home. And we, we end up bringing those in. And those are the donations. Um, and then we resell those and in the restore. So those, you don't know what you're going to get mm-hmm. as opposed to, you know, most commercial enterprises that have, you know, distribu- distribution center with uh, specific product codes and, and you can buy 40 of those and put them on your shelves. And then your online store has the depth to sell. Yeah. Cause you may we, only have yeah, like only, one item. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, and with, with online um, sales and, and e-commerce, you have to, you know, digitize everything. So it's, it's not just taking a picture Mm-mm. and putting it on there. It's putting a description of the item and you may only get one and then it sells in the store and then you got to pull it off the, yeah. uh, you know, the website. So a lot of work goes on behind the scenes um, for us to, to operate our online store. And it's a, it's a challenge for Brandon. But I think once he gets a certain inventory of, of items, the descriptions start to become the same mm-hmm. for certain items. And then it's just the picture that changes. Yeah. So we're, we're developing that, um, that ability to, uh, to have the online commerce store uh, streamlined and uh, so that we can put unique items on there all the time. Nice. Okay, cool. I got a foot spa. <laughs> oh, you did. <laughs> yes. Did, yeah. When she got the Roomba, yeah, right? The same yeah. Thing. I was like, yes, let's just go. And then we spent like, I probably like 45 minutes just like walking around and being like, Oh, that's so cool. Like, All my partner project. ever wants to do. It's like day day. She's like, let's go to the restore. I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, let's go. What are I we going to buy? Day. Yeah. yeah. Now let's talk. So you've been at the root with Habitat for since May. Mm-hmm. And what is your official title? Affiliate services coordinator. What does that mean? What do you do? <laughs> I'm right now focused on family services. Okay. Uh, our application process for home ownership has opened for the first time in two years, mm-hmm. three years. Really? Yeah. So when I came on board, I actually um, just started doing a lot of research. What are other affiliates doing? What have what has our affiliate done in the past? Pulling together data and old packages and old applications and trying to make it for now and make it. Um, the right message. So that's what I've been working on. And we just uh, closed applications uh, for this project for 633 Sydney uh, Street, which is kind of up by Reed's Dairy. Mm-hmm. And we're going through that process right now with the families that have applied and, and uh, kind of undertaking not just a financial review, but a needs review. It involves a home visit and them attending information sessions because we really believe that we we want to give a hand up, not a handout. So if we get a family that comes into a home and they're not prepared, we're not really actually helping them. Mm-hmm. Can we talk more about how Habitat, what what you do and providing housing and how that works for the community and maybe the struggles of trying to get housing in a community? Do you want to talk about the particulars of the build probably so that... So- I'll, I'll start, yeah, I guess with uh, the land acquisition and or the uh, the construction process. And then uh, Bridget can talk about the mortgages, I think, because that's usually the uh, the spot that everybody wants to know. Yeah, I didn't even know that was part of it. Yeah. I'm ready. Let's do this. Um, so as, uh, as Bridget had said that, you know, this isn't about a handout. It's uh, about a hand up. So a lot of people think that Habitat gives away houses for free. And that's not, in fact, the case because um, nothing in life is free. Um, and, and we are trying to support, uh, hardworking Canadian families, uh, getting, get, get a home and, um, you know, achieve, uh, independence, uh, self, uh, reliance and, and stability in their lives. So it all starts with the community to start. Um, we were fortunate coming out of the pandemic, uh, mayor Panchuk at the time, uh, felt that, uh, the housing crisis was something that Habitat could uh, help alleviate. And uh, he and, and council had uh, had some land that they felt would be a good opportunity for Habitat to leverage and, and um, you know, refurbish and, and help the community. So the, the one particular land uh, was at 3, tra- or sorry, not 3, uh, uh, 633 Sydney, uh, which is Kitty Corner, through Tracy, which was another house that we had done two years ago. It was the last house that we did, um, ab- actually about a year and a half ago, notwithstanding. We uh, had this uh, piece of land that the city felt that they uh, didn't need anymore. So what was going to happen 
was the uh, intersection of Tracy and Sydney mm -hmm. was supposed to be restructured when, when they were doing all that infrastructure work oh. because it was a really weird intersection, kind of misaligned and cars didn't know if they were turning left or it going straight. It was a straight. weird intersection. Yeah. It, 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 was, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was accidents wait, waiting to happen. So the city did the right thing while they were restructuring um, the, the road. Um, thought, okay, well, we'll uh, uh, appropriate that that particular building and make the intersection more um, more standard and safe. Well, when they redid the the intersection, uh, they they figured out they didn't need to take that house down, and so the the city had already owned that house, and they thought, okay, well, now what are we going to do with the house? And and so I guess at council they had decided that it would be best to donate that land to Habitat. And so we, we did acquire the land. It, it um, unfortunately, because they, they had decided that uh, it didn't, it was going to eventually come down. It, re, it, it was in a state of, of uh, disrepair, mm -hmm. significant disrepair. So when we got it, uh, we, we had to do, do some construction and renovation on it. And uh, some uh, local contractors um, stepped up and offered to assist. And one of the contractors in particular um, was a very, uh, helpful in making sure that it was affordable. Um, so we we worked together. That house uh, ended up becoming ready, and that's that's the family um, family services aspect that Bridge is going to talk about once that house gets ready. Um, the second uh, piece of land that the city provided us was uh, six thirty nine Sydney, so just further down the street. And right now we've got a duplex going up, uh, brand new construction. Uh, it's a it's a larger um, unit, uh, but it's going to house two uh, two families. Uh, that should be ready in about May. Um, and the city, again, for the same reasons, uh, felt that uh, that that needed to be uh, expropriated, but they they didn't end up using it and uh, donating it donating it to Habitat. And then so we've got those two pieces of land, but uh, we uh, we also received uh, the ninety three Dundas Street location, which was the former police station across from Dairy Queen. Oh. Yes. So the uh, the city had, um, well, obviously has that for the police station and felt, well, you know, we could probably really put a big dent into um, affordable home ownership uh, if, if we gave that to Habitat. And so we did receive that. We've done preliminary work on uh, environmental assessments. Mm -hmm. um, so ESA, is, it's called the ESA Phase 1. Uh, and we also have, have done some designated substance surveys, uh, which identify where in the building, the existing building, uh, there might be some asbestos or lead that would need to be abated before we could demolish that building. Because that's the plan is. Oh, you can't even demolish it if there's. No, if it's got contaminants in it, you have to identify where all the contaminants are first, take care of the contaminants, get the yell clear, and then you can uh, tear down the building afterwards. Is most of the uh, property... That habitat builds on or renovates is it donated or does habitat no. on occasion like you would have to buy yeah we we do buy land um we we've been fortunate in that this last city council um and the the previous mayor uh were very generous and mm -hmm. very adamant that affordable home ownership was very important to them and they felt that they had enough surplus land that they could donate it to habitat mm -hmm. to truly make um the affordable aspect um uh, really come to life. And so, which is great. And that's really helped us get back up off the ground uh, because as I said, we, we started from scratch all over again. I haven't gone through four executive directors in four years. It, it really was. Wow. In a state Sorry, of, bringing that word back. Yeah. Yeah. So it really was a challenge to, to identify what opportunities we had and the city stepped up and made sure that they gave us the opportunities and we're, we're delivering on them right now. I know it doesn't look like a lot's happening at 93 Dundas, but um, it's because a lot of work has to go on in the background, um, surveying, uh, getting the right approvals, uh, getting the right design, getting the costing done properly to make sure that it'll be affordable. So there's a lot of that work that goes on in the background. Um, I think too, that's for instance, I forget that all still has to happen. It's not just like, boom, a right. habitat house is up. You have to do go through planning and zoning and it's not like a McDonald's going up. No, yeah. it's, yeah. it's a process and you, you still have to pay for construction. Like there are a lot of volunteer builds, but that you still have to pay contractors, right? Well, they, yeah, it, nothing is free. Yeah. And, and so even the contractors, yeah, they, they do charge a, a fee because they can't do stuff for free either. Mm -hmm. and there's small aspects of it that can be donated, but 
you also have, you know, certain legal requirements to, uh, you know, abide by. And those, those are, you know, some licensing means you got to charge a fee for various aspects of the construction. That's the way that the, you know, it all works. But um, going back to how the land is acquired. So we've been fortunate to have uh, some donations mm -hmm. and legacy as well. Like uh, some, some folks that, uh, um, you know, realize that uh, their, their, you know, life was, was um, coming to what we all are going to have to face at some point uh, felt that leaving a legacy of their home uh, for a charitable purpose was, was the way to go. And so we have received those kind of uh, estate uh, legacy giving opportunities. And um, uh, Dave Vashon was, was the most recent in, in my tenure who donated his home to us. And fortunately it was in such a bad state of repair that we just felt selling it would be the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But that house that we sold that he left us is what's giving us the houses, two houses on 639 Sydney. Oh. So we're turning his one legacy into two. Um, and, and I think he'd be really happy with that. Yeah. Um, so the flip side of that is, yes, we do buy land mm -hmm. and we do buy homes. But uh, right now we've got enough projects on the go getting us back up off the ground uh, that'll keep us busy for the next three years. Uh, that uh, we feel comfortable that we're uh, we're 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 heading in the right direction, and if something comes up uh, to buy, um, yeah, we will pursue it. But right now, I just don't. The economic background in, yeah. in me is uh, saying I don't think right now is the time to buy. Um, a, Maybe I'll a use that unless too. we actually have to. Not the time. But um, you know, if there's an opportunity where it's it's the right time and, and the right place, you know, we'll have to figure out how to finance it. But. Uh, all of our all of our resources right now are going into uh, what we want to build at 93 Dundas, which is the 66 unit, uh, one two three uh, condo mm -hmm. style unit I plus maybe some again. townhomes. 66 units. Yeah. That's, that's, a that's lot of amazing. Families. That's yeah. so many families. Just, I'm like that's like game changing. That's for a so lot of game changing. People. Yeah. Well, that'll give us. I'd like to. Tr we we promise 66. I'd like to try and make it 66 yeah. or more. Wow. Um, because plus the three that we've delivered, uh, will have delivered in the next uh, few months, you know, it gets us up around 70 mm -hmm. and our affiliate in the 20, what, seven years of existence has produced 31 homes. So that's how many homes Habitat has built so far in yeah. Belleville. And yeah. you guys are going to... And just you're just going to fly it past it. In three, three years. years. How has COVID impacted the builds and Habitat? Because... Was it, is that why like builds haven't really been happening? It's exactly why. Yeah. And, and same with the volunteer builds that mm -hmm. you were men mentioning earlier. It's just unfortunate that, um, COVID and, and being close, close proximity of each other really has taken away the, the comfort level that people had working in tight spaces. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, uh, didn't want to come back out to volunteer in any aspect. And then we're not the only organization feeling that volunteer information, Quinny, has been having a hard time trying mm -hmm. to recruit uh, back to the levels they had pre COVID. Um, and we're, we're slowly getting there. I think, um, I think spring will probably be that final reprieve of COVID becoming, um, you know, part of our normal lives. Um, and, uh, the influenza becoming what it used to be and still is, it's never going to go away. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, uh, personally just thinking through all of the uncomfortable moments that we've had, we're coming out of them. Spring is always that, that new, a, a period where people get back outdoors and want to do stuff uh, again. So we're, we're expecting some volunteer uh, numbers to rise one more time. The, the opportunity to do volunteer builds might change the way it, we, uh, we do it because of liability issues, insurance issues. I mean, uh, those two things are real and, and they cost money. Mm -hmm. uh, insurance premiums are going up. Uh, so doing volunteer builds is, is not what it used to be. And, and also the cost of lumber and the cost of materials and, and, you know, doing the volunteer builds, we have a certain, uh, you know, level of quality. And while it's fun to do a volunteer build and it's very, you know, uh, you can't waste plywood based, right now. It, it, right, and, and undoing, sometimes undoing a bit of the work yeah. that gets done. It, it slows down the project. Mm -hmm. It costs more money, uh, the liability issue. So we're, we're going to reinvent the way that volunteers can participate in a build. We're still going to do something, but we're just trying to figure out the way that it's going to look. But uh, that that's a work in progress right now. I would like to say we did two of the women's volunteer builds. Um, the siding that I put up on Donald Street is still up. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> siding can be tricky. Yeah. Well, it's still there and it hasn't moved. Did you do I any drywall? 
you're willing it into place. Yeah. Yeah, she's she's like, like, you will stay stay. on the windy days we've had. She's like, you're not going anywhere. (laughs) Yeah. We did the the siding and then we did a moisture barrier. Oh, Oh, nice. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. Is it exciting to drive by a house that you, it makes me honestly, well, we did that one and then we did one in Times Niagara and the tiny nigga one was like, I think we were just like flattening out land. We weren't That's ready. important too, on, yeah. especially yeah. when you're about to pour a foundation. Yeah. So, but it, it was really like rewarding. Mm-hmm. And every time I drive by, I just get like a warm, fuzzy feeling. Cause I'm like, you know what? Like, I, I want to do more stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe not like building things for people, but you know, like. It's it's all about the hands as well, right? The hands and the and the effort and the and the yeah. heart, yeah, and the heart. yeah, and the heart, yeah. Like I mean, I want the help. It just yeah. may not be certain things. The siding's I'm up. Not, we're good. I can do siding. <laughs> yeah. There has never been a volunteer that's come and spent a day with us that hasn't left without making a huge difference. Yeah. So I'm assuming whatever you do will be, will be, it'll be helpful. helpful. Yeah. Okay, and then so once the house is almost done, mm-hmm. or once our projects are almost done, that's where family services goes into high gear, and that's where Bridget comes. So that's you. That's me. Family services. Mm-hmm. So yeah, how when do you, you step in towards the end, and then that's the, when the application process starts? Yeah. So we didn't have a current application process even ready to launch. So I actually did the research and built the application. Right now, we're using um, a community partner called Verifast that's kind of helping us with the first initial financial review. Mm-hmm. And then we meet with our family selection committee and we discuss uh, this preliminary report that is built with the data from these financial reviews of the families and um, try to decide who we can actually help, right? Because if we're seeing what they're paying for rent now, and it's much lower than something we could offer through a mortgage, we don't want to take those families out of an affordable situation Mm -hmm. and put them into something that's going to be unaffordable. We really want to build a successful uh, place for a family to be, and we can't do that if we over over finance them. Uh, So the families that move on from that financial review then are asked to do um, a self-needs assessment. So we ask them lots of questions, and uh, my, I have to tell this, this story because it's my favorite part of doing this work. So I have four kids and often I end up bringing my work home and just setting up on the couch with my laptop. And my eight-year-old son sat down next to me and he was um, looking at this spreadsheet I was starting to build uh, for this needs assessment. And he's like, space to do activities. He's like, well, mom, I could... I could say that we don't have this about our apartment. We can't do activities here. He's like, but this new house we're moving to, I can do activities there. So seeing it through his eyes Mm -hmm. really hit home for me, like how important this one little box was going to be. Um, So in that self uh, needs assessment, we also walk through like family budgeting and what would you need from a house? You know, how many kids do you need in a bedroom? Uh, what you know? What's your your parent situation look like? So we we bring that information in again. Bring back our our committee, review it, uh, and then decide who moves on to the next stage, which is home visits. So myself and a committee member a volunteer will come to your home and really um, get a full appreciation of what's going on in your life, in your home, in your finances. So that we can make sure the right person gets in the right house. Mm-hmm. I love that you actually go out to meet them mm-hmm. because then it's like it's less of like you know this is an application. It's like mm-hmm. you know it's you're actually putting like you get to know them kind of. You know what I mean? Like it's a twenty five year relationship. Yeah. Um, when you have wow. a mortgage, oh, because right? of the mortgage. Okay. And so these are families that, at minimum, I will talk to you once a year when we do your annual income review to make sure that your mortgage is geared to your income. Um, but I, I know that maybe it's it's different, but I always think that Habitat's kind of like a bank with a bit of feeling. And I'm that bit of feeling in a very financial institution. Does Habitat hold the mortgage? Is that how it works? Yeah. Okay. So yes. it's not like a big scary bank's involved. You are the bank. There is a bit of discussion. Did you want to go into that, the new mortgage? Or did you want? Yeah, um, no, you can if you're ready. Somebody. Uh, so <laughs> Habitat, is it national or just Canada that's deciding to do this? Well, 
Canada. Canada mm-hmm. um, to have the first part of the mortgage held with a credit union and the second part held with Habitat so that we can make it affordable for everyone. Oh, okay. Um, so it's still 0% down. It, right now, the current application process is 0% interest. Uh, if, we, if and when we do move to that, that new mortgage model, as we're calling it, that, that financial percentage will still uh, be very, very low, but not zero anymore. So people who live in a Habitat house, they're not necessarily all paying the same amount because it would be based off the house. Yes. I just learned something new about Habitat. So it has to be sold at fair market value. Yeah. Um, Canada Revenue Agency has some very strong legislation around it for charities. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we are uh, obligated to charge fair market value. Uh, what what we were doing in the past was what we called our, our classic model was uh, offering zero down, zero percent. And when economic times are good, uh, you can do that. And because of the, the difference between the cost of construction, which we try to keep low, and the fair market value is what gives us the ability to sustain that mortgage over 25 years at zero down, zero interest. Because mm-hmm. over time, inflation and, and amounts um, that you know uh, eat into what would be equity uh, for a homeowner, we're absorbing. And that equity continues to grow for the home, homeowner instead. So with the current economic times the way they are, uh, interest rates are going to be up over 6%. Uh, inflation is at you know somewhere between 7 and, and 9 uh, at this point. Um, and it's starting to uh, taper off because the uh, Bank of Canada has uh, continued to increase int- interest rates, which slows down the, the rate of uh, economic growth and, and uh, brings inflation back to hopefully you know more uh, reasonable levels, which was always somewhere between 1.5% and 2% in an uh, what I'd call normal, quote unquote, normal economic times. So we were always able to do zero down, zero percent with that kind of model. Now, with the cost of construction going so high, um, the fair market value not being, you know, what we used to have in this in this area, you know, the average price of a home went from 200000 to 700000 mm-hmm. over the course of three years. Well, we can no longer, as a charitable organization, sustain a zero percent uh, down zero interest uh, mortgage. So we have to partner with, uh, you know, third party lending institutions uh, and be it a credit union, be it a, you know, a big, a big uh, six bank. Uh, we have to figure out what uh, that looks like. We're, we're actually in the process of doing that, especially for our uh, next build at 639 Sydney, but more importantly, the uh, 66 units that uh, we're, we're building at uh, 93 Dundas. Uh, we do expect to have some form of a, a lending partner involved in that to hold the first mortgage for 25 years. We can't get around the no down payment for, uh, particularly for the big banks or any bank. I think that's written into whether you're Schedule One or Schedule Two bank. You have to uh, have a down payment as part of um, the uh, the lending process, and so we would hold the down payment. We would um, be um, helping with the down payment that would serve as a second mortgage. So because we're holding a second mortgage uh, with the down payment included, that gives us the ability to still offer zero down um, for the, the first lender uh, being uh, another financial institution for the first 25 years. And then we, we work on the mortgage past the 25th year uh, with the homeowner and, and see where they're at at that point, along with checking in with them every single year to make sure they can still meet their uh, financial commitment. But the banks are the ones that are are driving it at that point. Mm-hmm. It's now no longer us um, doing what we called an annual income review uh, to make sure that their financial situation hasn't changed drastically so that they would not be able to afford that mortgage with us anymore. That would then transfer over to the banks to to manage. So okay. it is it is a changing aspect because of the world changing around us that we can't control, but we will still try to provide that that impact for families uh, by being there with them and, and helping them through that process uh, and the process along the way until they achieve that uh, independence by being mortgage free at some point. So you do work with the families to make sure they understand and and like can budget the accordingly for. So it's more than just like throwing them into a new house. Absolutely. Um, I think what is most important to know is their mortgage payments are what goes back into fund future bills. Mm-hmm. So if they don't succeed, we don't succeed. Mm-hmm. 
So it's just a long investment. I've learned so much because I guess I just assumed, you know, I see the pretty picture at the end. Here's a family and a new Mm -hmm. house, but you don't really think about all the steps that have to go into that before and after to make it sustainable for the community. Well, it's, it's, it's by the community, right? And Mm -hmm. that's, that's what makes it so great is it takes a village to build a house. Mm -hmm. It really does. And then that's the way it was in the, the old, old, old days, right? The, the farmers, when they were trying to put up a barn, well, every farmer from, you know, 20 square miles around came and helped, you know, put up mm-hmm. that barn over the course of a, a week and uh, and then went back to their lives. And that's that's the kind of thing that it is today with Habitat is everybody contributes in some different way, whether it's dropping off a donation at the back gate, uh, coming in and shopping, volunteering in some aspect in the restore, in the warehouse or at a build when we figure that part out. Uh, donating their cash, uh, you know, that they feel they can uh, do becoming a monthly donor legacy giving. Mm-hmm. Um, we had someone who uh, had left uh, RRSPs uh, for us when they, when they passed away and that goes into our investment fund. Mm-hmm. So there is um, a lot of different ways that the community gets involved uh, to help build one house. And that's the beauty of, of Habitat. And I think that's probably a good transition into the housing continuum, right? Mm-hmm. Like this. And I actually, Brought a picture because sometimes when I my friends have actually forbid me from using the word housing continuum in conversation. What does that mean? Exactly. Perfect. Um, and I love, I, think, I love a diagram if that's I, what I'm about to look at. Right. I'm, on, so, <laughs> I'm so sorry that everybody can't see this. We'll Don't worry, it. we'll post it. We'll post it. <laughs> but I think it's I think it's helped me understand how to even ask the community to all pitch in. Right. Because why do you care about affordable home ownership if it's not going to directly impact you in your life? Um, So you'll see that the housing affordability continuum, which is put out by CMHC, starts at homelessness, works to emergency shelters, to transitional housing, to social housing, Mm -hmm. to affordable rental housing, to affordable home ownership, to market rental housing to market home ownership. So Habitat for Humanity is the only person that's kind of like in here in this affordable home ownership. Mm -hmm. But I think what a lot of people on either side of Habitat don't understand is that uh, helping Habitat helps everybody on this whole path. Because um, if I can use my life as an example, I was in a two bedroom apartment with four kids and all of our pets and myself, right? So I was holding up Um, a market rate rental that would have been more appropriate for two people or, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, my mom and two kids. And so then when I moved in to my afford, like my market rate rental house, which was more appropriate for me, it lightened up the load on this side. Right. So when everybody is in their proper space on the housing continuum, there is space for everybody so with Habitat working on the affordable home ownership, it means that we can get families from more of that like social housing side mm-hmm. into home ownership opportunities. And then everybody can keep shifting and then people are where they're supposed to be. I have goosebumps and I'm not sure why, but I'm just kind of inspired, I guess. And that's what I'm hoping by kind of, I know that housing continuum is not the most exciting of words, but it's what, uh, like, I've lived it. I understand. And I think because I've lived it and because I have such a deep understanding of it, I mean, every day I just wake up super motivated to come yeah. to work because I know the difference of having a place that feels like home and not having one. And mm-hmm. I mean, what that does to a person, what it does to a family and people who have a home are, are really fulfilled citizens who then go on to make fulfilled communities. I totally feel that. Cause I was in like a very similar situation. I was like in a two bedroom, like basement apartment with my daughter. Mm-hmm. And right before about probably right as COVID hit, my parents had bought us kind of like this like townhouse condo unit type situation. And it's the difference in how you feel Mm -hmm. in your home is it's completely different. Yeah. It's like you feel more secure. Like you're Mm -hmm. not worried if like someone's going to come in and be like, okay, your rent is now, you Mm -hmm. know, $800 more or especially with, you know, if it's a new build even, and you know, there's Mm -hmm. no actual rental, the increased guideline or whatever mm-hmm. it is. 
where there's no cap on how high it could go. It's like you're not constantly in fear of, mm -hmm. you know, losing your home. It's just like you get home and you feel like you're home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think people underestimate the impact home has on a person. Yeah. Unless you've ever been challenged yeah. by it. Just, you know, your mental health when you're in a space that feels right for you versus a space that you're just in because there's no other place to put your body. And I think even I'm, I'm, I had to start renting again and right now trying to find a rental that's affordable for certain family types mm -hmm. is so challenging. And then to have to just prove to someone that you deserve mm -hmm. that rental, like it's not even yours, but you have to like mm -hmm. lay everything out to be like, no, I swear I can't afford this. Please mm -hmm. let me. There's so many applications. There's so too. many applications and you just have to prove yourself. It's, it's just a weird living situation now. And I think people like I'm 27 and all my friends were like, what's about to happen when we have to start trying to buy houses and, you know, we're, we're scared. So just the fact that Habitat's giving people who have been along the housing continuum, I'm putting this word into my vocabulary now. Hey, so your friends are also sick of it and then I will. just hang out and talk to Perfect. each other about it. I do I that those. a lot. <laughs> One of the things that we have to do in our roles also is education. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not just about going from uh, renting to home ownership uh, because there, there are costs. When you mm -hmm. are renting, you don't have mm -hmm. to worry about repairs mm -hmm. for yeah. the most part. You don't have to worry about a lot of things. Uh, that en ends up being part of the lease that the landlord uh, maintains the, the building or the unit. Um, a lot of homeowners don't realize that when they go and buy a house. There's they, so many things. You have to you have to budget. Even though there might not be anything today mm -hmm. wrong with a house, you should be budgeting mm -hmm. uh, for repairs and unexpected, unforeseen uh, issues with a house that, that do arise. So with all the windstorms that we have, right, roof repairs are becoming more and more common. There's a shingle on my front yard right now. Right. They're flying just all been over the place. At it. They're all over the place. <laughs> it's a it's a, a an SNL skit waiting yeah. to happen. So. Um, People don't have the money to do the repairs. Uh, your flooring starts to lift mm -hmm. uh, because maybe your tap under the uh, sink was leaking and now there's a spot uh, in the kitchen that's showing and you're like, oh, you trace it back and you've got now a great big kitchen repair. It's going to cost thousands of dollars. Where's that money going to come from? So there is an education component mm -hmm. around finance, um, you know, finance 101 mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to homeownership and managing your money that we, we also assist with. To make sure, because it, it, it is a little bit of, um, you know, again, a hand up, not a hand out. Mm -hmm. So if repairs happen and are required, Habitat can't go in and do those repairs, um, you know, for free. We might be able to coordinate some repairs, but they would be at a cost. And, yeah. and you know, there's ways to finance those um, types of repairs. But the reality is that when you become a homeowner, it's your home. Mm -hmm. You've got to fix it. And a lot of people forget that part of it when, when you, you go from renting to buying. And so education is a big part of what we do because we want people to be successful. Mm -hmm. So it starts right back at that needs assessment. We work with you through your, your monthly budget. Do you have the room to take on the responsibilities of home ownership? And then we discuss it again at the home visit. And then if you become an accepted uh, partner family, then we have information sessions where we talk to you about home repair about budgeting and making sure that you are set up for the long term. This is not just here's your keys and then hope for the best. This is we have spent a substantial amount of time preparing you for what's going to come because we do know that most of our families have been on that side of the continuum, right? They've been renters and may not have the mm -hmm. skills necessary. I don't think we're really prepared either. Like we're not taught these things in school. No, no. I we mean, recently just now. talked about how many filters you have to change in your house that you may not know about. Too many. Too many. Furnaces. Oh. Furnaces. Fridges. Oh, it's yeah. Chaos. Fridges. I, when I moved, I vacuumed them. I'm like, no one told me no. that this was a problem. I'm like, this looks but like a fire It's so hazard. special to teach people that because we talk about budgeting all the time and how no one taught us that in school. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of have to teach yourself. So the fact that Habitat takes that time to help with the people moving into those houses is mm -hmm. really important. And it's the things in the background that a mm -hmm. lot of people maybe don't know that Habitat are, is doing. I think I didn't realize what Habitat was doing. I kind of thought that you were like 
the landlords and, you know, I didn't understand it. And I've learned so much today and now I want to get involved. <laughs> Perfect. So the best way for people to get is, would it be volunteering? Like, yeah. Yeah. So our website, um, has I'm on a, it right a now. spot where <laughs> volunteers can, uh, can go and, and see what aspects to volunteering, uh, exist. So whether it's a volunteering uh, opportunity with the board of directors, as an example, mm -hmm. uh, or with the uh, the restore or on a build, um, you know, there's there's different different uh, buttons to click and mm -hmm. applications to fill out, and uh, then it goes to the right person uh, who would would then be in contact. It's that it's that we try to make it that easy. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of clicks and put a little info in, and we'll call you. Okay, and, and then, we have a lot of fun. Like yeah. uh, we, I just did a special event at the restore. We launched our the ornaments. Yes, we did our first annual ornament launch party at the restore, um, and so we had volunteers come to that, and so they they um, they handed out hot cocoa and they talked to customers, and we had a scavenger hunt, and so I've never seen a volunteer have a bad time. <laughs> I think we are um, we're a little family there, and we're a lot of fun to hang out with if I may be so <laughs> bold to say. Can you tell us about the, the ornament? Like, yeah, well, oh, the like, ornament. Was, I should have brought one to show you. I actually meant to, but I licked both of the ones I had at my house. Which, <laughs> I was taking I was taking pictures yesterday of oh, the okay. snow and I sat it down. I'm like, well, now I can't see it. And I'm like, oh. why not? <laughs> that one's mine now. <laughs> um, so we were trying to think of a way to have an ongoing fundraiser and home holidays it's kind of synonymous right mm -hmm. um so there's actually a company in muskoka that will custom create pewter ornaments uh, for anybody um really amazing <laughs> <The> design <laughs> yeah not you guys though. i was don't, gonna say don't like, steal want, my thunder <laughs> like, i want an ornament, I want an ornament. <laughs> well i would recommend that this you buy one well i me. was going to because i saw the press release and i was like yeah I want to go to that, but then I couldn't go. Okay. We had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. Uh, so this ornament is uh, seasonally non-denominational. So if oh. you would just like to hang it in a window, yeah, um, it totally works for that. Works on a tree, but twenty five dollars, and it's a donation to show that you are investing in your community. Love it. And I would really love it. We've got we've got a couple handfuls left. And okay. uh, today, when I go back to the office, I'm going to be kind of launching it online, and it'll be available through our online store at the at the resource. Well, we'll share website, it on our yes, socials please. too this week. Yeah, I'll, share I, I'll share it on the station too. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. very. It just it was a little idea that I flew past everybody, and I'm pretty excited. Christmas is my favorite thing in the entire world. Ah, you're a Christmas girl. I have forced everybody at the affiliate to get <laughs> He just has like a side board. smirk. He's like, mm. I would say forced. I think everybody loves Christmas. I mean, mm. except the Grinch, which I think everybody's, uh, you know, we don't have any comes Grinches. around near the end. Yeah. But we, we did the parade. We did this ornament. We had the launch at the restore. Like it's, I don't know. It's habitat and it's family and it's houses and it's holidays and it's it just feels really good. So people can still get the ornament. Mm -hmm. um, you can come in to the, the store. store. Okay. You can buy it online. You awesome. can. I maybe I'll drive it to your house if you live in Belleville. Okay. I offer too much, but I'm pretty excited yeah. about it. Okay, we're gonna share. Or if you just want to come to our office and donate like five hundred dollars, one thousand okay. dollars, I'll just give you. You one. have to do what we do, and when we say a name, we're like, "That's five hundred dollars." Thank you. It hasn't worked yet, <laughs> but. Fingers crossed. We do um, occasionally, every once in a while, have someone just pop into the office with a handful of cash. So you do accept just handfuls of money. I do accept pop in. handfuls of money. Okay, um, noted. Yes. No. Well, I also accept handfuls. Of I money do. That I will give to you. Happy. Yeah. <laughs> Pause them, I think we will free. issue a tax receipt for <laughs> okay. that handful of money. Yeah. To, Perfect. Uh, make yeah, sure oh, that yeah. everything has a track yes, record. Yes, of course. There's Are more really? than just my warm wishes and an ornament yes. attached to. Any There's donation. receipts. You can also pet my dog. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I do bring my dog to the office. We love it, an office dog. Yeah. Trade's she, not here today. It, it's fun because she comes in and it's like, hi, Bridget. Cricket. You know, like yeah. nobody cares about people anymore. No. But it's nice because then uh, she is my therapy dog. But then when other people need a dog hug, you get a dog hug. A whole good vibe. We have an office dog. Too. We have an office dog. He's not in today. Sometimes he wears his rain suit in. It's mm. really cute. 
This was great. I We did take 55 minutes of your time. So, so sorry. And I didn't even tell any of my best stories. <laughs> <laughs> it's because your boss is here. I know. <laughs> Our boss isn't allowed to come in the room when we're recording. He came in once, actually. Twice. Mm-hmm. And we're like, go away. <laughs> I can't yell at my mic. Uh, well, he doesn't usually. Our boss is her dad. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Nepotism. It's my favorite. <laughs> is there anything else you want to shout out? We're going to share all your socials in the show notes. Um, anything else? Like, yeah, we'll share. And we'll share. Ball, yeah. The ornament. The address of the restore. I'm yeah, we're, we're across from the casino. Yeah. Uh, 365 Bell Boulevard. Nice. Uh, so it's a convenient location. And uh, yeah, I, if I could give a shout out, I'd say to our board of directors uh, for all their volunteer work because um, they do a lot of work behind the scenes and they're asked to do a lot. There's a lot of committees mm-hmm. that go uh, on to make sure that we are uh, doing uh, value added work uh, in the community. So to the board of directors, a uh, huge thank you. And, and to the, the board uh, chair and vice chair uh, and uh, past chairs, uh, a really well, uh, good job, especially through covid uh, keeping us uh, as an affiliate and keeping us going. And then to the community as a, a group of uh, donors and, uh, you know, everybody that is in the community that, that knows Habitat and has always been our uh, in our corner supporting us. Mm-hmm. Huge, huge shout out and thank you. And we look forward to new donors and new uh, volunteers. Yeah. yeah. And, and to the volunteers that are with us right now and our regulars, they do amazing work. There is one volunteer that every time she comes to the restore, you can tell because she has folded every blanket. She has organized the pillows and it just looks like a completely new place. And it's one person that yeah. comes in for a couple hours a day and she makes all the difference in the world. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Come come be that person. Come be that person. Yeah. I want to give a shout out to you guys. Yeah. The amazing work that you're doing yeah. for our community. Like it's completely invaluable and you guys change lives. And, and yeah. I hope people just understand more about Habitat after this. I learned a whole Habitat has changed my life. Yeah. And I only work there. So I'm hoping that yeah. through Habitat changing my life, I can then help Habitat change a lot of lives. Wow. You're doing good stuff. Guys. Well, thank you for being the most qualified people to come on the <laughs> pod so far and to actually put up with us for almost an hour. What a challenge to the next people. Oh. That was amazing. It was. It really was. Like... I didn't realize, and I guess I was just naive, naive to think that Habitat for Humanity was just the restore. Mm-hmm. Slash, I thought it was just building houses and giving it to people. Yeah. I didn't realize there was mortgages and educating people on how to be homeowners and how to do mortgages. Yeah. And- like, I knew there was a mortgage aspect just because we had done a couple of the women's mm-hmm. builds. and But I didn't realize that they, like, stayed with them and coached them through things and, like, mm-hmm. helped them just life. Yeah. And I'm like, that's great because a lot of us don't have those essential skills. No. No. You know what I mean? Like, I have no idea. Yeah, it's terrifying. Like, do I – the applying for a mortgage is so terrifying to me. Don't get it. And I'm like, why Why? Why are all these things? What are closing co- – like, there's just there's, so there's much. So many I feel things. like we need to have a real – We do, and I think we've said that. Hazim – spoke so well about it like he's just so full of knowledge and so professional he's what i would like to be so professional so professional bridget just telling us about the housing continuum didn't know what that was now i do we'll share a graphic of what that is because i think it is important to talk about and it's well i just never thought about it in that sense no but it makes perfect sense yeah and the housing right now is crazy it's well, that and it's like, and then we have inflation. It, it literally a report just came out, like just now, saying that grocery store prices have gone up eleven percent in the last month. Yeah, it's gro- and I'm like, what the hell? Why am I paying nine dollars for a case of iced tea? Yeah, and like, like lettuce, I was I was looking at prices this morning. Romaine lettuce is like eight dollars. Butter is like nine dollars. Jeanette was like, are we going to have to get a cow to start churning our own butter? I was like, probably. Can you not? You can make butter with just like milk, yeah, right? Yeah, with cream, I think. A cream. But cream's expensive. That was a tangent. Ugh. Everything is just expensive. Everything's expensive. But I just, one, go support the restore. Honestly, yeah. It's like I I start going there now before, like when, when I need to make a like larger purchase. Yeah. Or I'm just, like, looking for stuff. Like, I always go to the restore. Yeah, I'm like, and now 
they were telling us about the online store, which is pretty sick. So, so cool. that's, you can go there. It's www.restorepeh.ca, and that's their online store. But you can also get to that from their regular website, habitatpeh.org. And I've ordered stuff from the Restore, and it was super easy. Mm-hmm. They're very friendly. You go pick it up, right? Yeah, you go pick yeah. it up. Um, and they also have the ornament right now yes. um, with proceeds going back into Habitat. And they have, I know they have two builds going on on Sydney Street, I believe. Yes. And then they're, they're in the initial processes for the old police station, which is so cool. 66 units is going to be life-changing for That's, people. I just have some other things. I started a couple a couple episodes ago, you told you asked if I was watching the sex lives of college girls. College girls. When I was sick, I binge-watched. It's It's so good, but I have to say, they are false advertising of the queer relationship. It is hilarious. Are you at the chlamydia part? Yeah, that happened. (laughs) But this, so Layden, I'm going to, spoiler, spoiler, so if you haven't watched it. Layden comes out, she's open about being a lesbian, and and then she's just meeting all these girls, doing things, she gets chlamydia, blah, blah, blah. It happens. It happens. Do your own thing. Um... And But then she meets this, like, beautiful girl who's just like, I like you. And, of course, she just happens to be a lesbian. That does not happen. You can't. How? 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 I'm just like, no, no, no. When but I came maybe, out. Maybe the Gen Zs are like that now, though. Maybe. Maybe it's new age. Because I came out in third year. Yeah. It was, like, a struggle puddle of trying to find. Other lesbians. Other lesbians. I'm going to ask Kate. Be like, when people come out, like, or do you just, like, can you just hit on anybody? Yeah. And then just, like, shoot your shot with anybody before knowing, like, their actual sexuality? Hoping like, are they the best? all kind of a little bit gay? I don't you know. Mean, I don't know. I don't think so. I think some are generally well, no, straight. Yeah, but, like, are they just, like, like, say I'm in high school and I hit on another girl without knowing. Do they just go with it and be like, oh, no, sorry, I'm straight? Maybe that's what... I used to be very forward and try and, like... I need to have Kate on the podcast because I have Can we so- please have a Gen Z perspective? I just need to know what's going on. I think I'm going to have Kate and her friend. I Marley. feel like we need to have Megan on, too, because she's an older Gen Z, like yeah. Jen's daughter. I just need to understand, like, these these youths. Did you ask her if she has any gay friends? I'm sure, I, like, kids are coming out in grade 8 now. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm, She probably does. I, I, didn't just- co- I came out rather late. I didn't come out until I was 20, 22. I don't think I ever really, like, officially came out. You came out on this podcast. I came out on the podcast. I will say many people come out to me for some reason. You're an easy person to come out to. I'm just like, that's great. Awesome. Everyone should be gay. That was just my little tangent. That's a great tangent. Um, oh, I, um, the, uh, so Sunday, was it Sunday night? Yeah. Okay, so Sunday night, I was partaking... In an activity that helps me sleep. Uh huh. It's weed. It's not sexy times. Yeah. Um. And I come across a post on Belleville Neighbors about a woman screaming on Cool One Hundred. Oh yeah, this was good. And I'm like, okay. So I'm like reading this over, and I'm like, this is concerning. So I message Katie. I'm like, Katie. I'm like, what could be happening right now in the cool studio that somebody is screaming? So my immediate thought, of course, is activities, adult <laughs> activities. It wasn't that. It wasn't. It was a song. It was a song. It was the YouTube version of the song that was pulled. But I was, like, convinced coming in Monday that it was either going to be very awkward or there was going to be a murder scene above my office. <laughs> and I panicked about it. Yeah. And then I built a whole, like, PR plan about how we were going to, like, announce to people, like, what it actually was. That's so funny. But it wasn't that big of a deal. It really wasn't even that big of a deal. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, that was that. That was that. It was funny. It was kind of like a panic for, like, 10 minutes. And then I was like, whatever it is is whatever it is. That's what I was thinking. I was just kind of like, like, 20 minutes after I messaged you and you're like, okay, I'm going to call Martha. I was like, okay. I'm like, should I call 911? (laughs) Just like my brain was spiraling. Yeah, that's fair. And um, then I'm like, no, I'm like, Katie's on it. I'm like, if Katie knows, then Martha knows, then Ferg knows, everything's Every- okay. I think everyone knew. I'm and like, it just turned out that it was the, the 
the song was the YouTube version of the song that was put on the countdown, and it has a scream in it. Yep. And with with no context, it's very alarming. I get that. <laughs> I just thought it was funny because, like, yeah. it's like, I'm like, I, I don't. No. My friend sent it to me, and I was like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> that's concerning. concerning it's not message. us accidentally turning on the radio. No, not Screaming. that time. Screaming in panic that we're on the radio. Oh. Um, do you have anything else that's like almost Christmas? It's almost Christmas. I feel if, like it's prime burnout season. Prime burnout season, it is. If you don't stress over things that you cannot control. Yeah. Like it's not going to be a perfect Christmas dinner. No. And you it's know what? Bad be weather's perfect- coming, so just don't risk it. Yeah, just stay home. Stay safe. Grab a bottle of wine if that's your jam. Buy our merch. Buy our merch. We have hope. You won't get it before Christmas. You won't get it before Christmas. Okay. Well, if you wanted stickers, magnets, and keychains, you could get that before Christmas um, at our website, babesofquinny.ca. Which is functional. It is not functional. Finished. Not finished, but functional. And that's really all I got. Yeah. Yeah. But I just want to say uh, thank you to Hazim and Bridget for telling us all about Habitat for Humanity. Um, And you can follow Habitat for Humanity, Prince Edward Hastings on Facebook at Habitat for Humanity, P-H-P-E-H, Instagram at Habitat for Humanity, P-E-H, and Twitter Habitat, or Twitter at Habitat, P-E-H. Is this our last episode before the new year? Or do we have one more? We have one more. Okay, cool. One more. Cool, cool. Because, of course, we're putting one out between Christmas. Of course we are. Uh, Why not?